It's good to be here for me. Uh, I was off with COVID last week, and it's like, what is going on with me and COVID? I've had it four times now. Four, four times. I can't believe it. And it's like, you know, um, this new variant went around, the flirt variant. And it's like my body went, oh, we haven't tried that one, have we? <laughs> Started feeling ill. And I thought, oh, I'll have to take a test. And I realized I've been taking the test wrong. Right? What you're supposed to do um, is you have to hold that thing, don't you, while you do it, and then squeeze it when you're pulling it out. And you have to wait five minutes. Well, I've never been known for my patients. I normally I'm just dab it and go, no, it's all right, I'm clear. But I read the instructions this time, and I waited. And after five minutes, the second line turned up. And instead of being, like, upset that I got COVID, I was happy because I passed the test. I'm like, I passed. I've got it. Yes. So I was at home with Rowan, and we were uh, watching Net Church on TV. I don't know how she did it, but she managed to hack into some live stream somewhere. And uh, there we were. We sat there and we worshipped with you and uh, we watched Marcia preach. Great, great message. And I did hear that um, my orthodox doctrine on the supremacy of Jollof Rice was openly challenged. I thought, how cheeky. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what to do because, because rice and peas is out there now. And, you know, I, I have to... I have to hold to the fact that um, some of the you know, Nigerian families in our church have thrown such great parties and they've made me feel like part of their family and, and that's why I feel like I am half Nigerian. <laughs> and so rice and peas has got to do some work. But I'm not, I'm not that shut in my doctrine that I'm not open to the possibility that there may be something out there. So what I am thinking is when we get to beach day, if you want to persuade me that rice and peas is better, then, you know, you can bring me a little bit of rice and peas. Yeah? And then we'll have a little bit of jollof and we can have a little seed, which is the best. So I'm talking today about the things we neglect, and um, we're going to read from the book of Mark, chapter 4, uh, and then chapter 5. So we start in Mark, chapter 4, and verse 35. We're just going to read one verse, and then we're going to go to chapter 5. And Jesus says this, he gets the disciples into the boat, and he says, we are going to the other side. Right, You know that account, don't you? We are going to the other side. And then what happens? They go out on the lake and Jesus is asleep and a huge storm comes up and so severe that you know these are experienced fishermen. They thought they were going to drown. And they went down and they, they shook Jesus. And they said, don't you care about us? You know, we're going to drown. And Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. And he speaks to the wind and the waves and they instantly stop. And then we're going to pick up where they actually get to the other side. So he gets to the other side, and uh, there is a man meeting him, the demoniac, and he is full of many demon spirits. And they cry out to Jesus, and they say, you know, what would you have with us? Would you torment us before our time? And they begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. And so Jesus cast the demons, spirits, out of the man, and they went into the pigs, and the pigs went crazy and ran off the edge of the cliff. And then all of the people rose up and demanded that Jesus leave that area. So here's a story, here's an account. Jesus, he's taking the disciples, and he says to them in the boat, we're going to the other side. And the significant thing about this is the other side was the um, area of the Gadarenes. Now, this area was a notoriously wicked area. Uh, it was an area that once was, it was Israel territory. And um, it had prospered under Israel for many years. And then what happened is they began to neglect their culture. They began to neglect their faith. 
they began to neglect the temple and, and they lost heart. And, you know, the area became run down and then more people moved in from the Decapolis, from the 10 cities around, um, which were in, the, in, in Syria. And people moved in and the people of Israel thought this place is going downhill. And, and so they moved out and they left the area. They neglected it. They let it get run down and then they abandoned it. And so the area now, although it was Israeli territory, although it was the territory of the people of Israel, it was completely overrun by Gentiles. And not not just like normal Gentiles, but really bad Gentiles, because the the Decapolis, the ten cities around that area in Syria, was known for wickedness, it was known for occultism, it was known for greed and violence and all those things. And when the people from the Decapolis moved into this area, they brought in all of their uh, wickedness, all of their evil practices, and any semblance of the godly nation, the godly place that it was at one time, was completely gone. And we know how bad it is because when Jesus goes there and he finds this man who's absolutely tormented with multiple evil spirits, he, the spirits ask that they can be thrown into the pigs. Now, in Israel, the pig is an unclean animal. And you, you would not have a pig. You wouldn't eat pigs. You wouldn't keep pigs in the garden. You certainly would never, ever have a pig farm. And this is like almost like an abomination to the people of Israel that all of the practices and the cultures and the things that were anti what they were about were now in this region. And so what they did was they just packed up, got on a ship boat, went to the other side of the river and pretended that place never existed. Now we got a place like that in this building. We moved in here about 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, we've been renovating, doing all kinds of things. And we went into this one room, and it's up in that corner at the back. And we opened the door, and the pigeons have been living in there for years. Like, I am telling you, like, they've whitewashed everything. And Heather and I opened the door, and then we shut the door, and we've lost the key. We've just like, that is so bad now, like no amount of bleach and Ajax is going to touch that. So we've just locked the door and pretended that that place isn't even there. Now one day we will get round to it. But what's happened is that the people of Israel, they've just, things have got so bad that they've just given up and gone away. And this is what happens when we neglect things in our lives. And Jesus, in this boat, and it's significant, he says, we're going to the other side. When he says we're going to the other side, he's not just saying we're going on a road trip. We're not just going to a picnic. We're going back to what you've left behind. We're going back to reclaim what you've lost. We're going back to undo what, 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 you know, what was lost in the first place. How many of you know that nothing, gets better on its own. You leave something, what happens to it? You know, your body, it needs work. It needs good food. It needs exercise. So, you know, you have muscles like Anthony. Up there, I'm like, oh. You have to work out to get like that, don't you? You have to walk and exercise and go to the gym. But if you leave your body and you just fill it with rubbish, what happens to it? You get what they call wardrobe syndrome. Everything that was up is now in your drawers. Relationships, they need work. Marriages need work. If you leave your marriage, you leave your wife, you leave your husband, what's going to happen to your relationship? Is it going to get better all on its own? It's going to deteriorate. What about your faith? What about your calling? What about your gifting? What about your work with God? What about your relationship with Jesus? Thank you very much. If you leave it, 
Is it going to get any better? It will just begin to deteriorate. Hebrews tells us in chapter 4, how, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If we neglect the things that God has done and spoken over our lives, if we don't feed our faith, if we don't feed our dreams, if we don't feed our spirit, what's going to happen is our faith will begin to deteriorate and diminish. If you don't use what God has given you, it will lessen. You know the parable of the talents. You know, to one was given five, to one was given ten, and the one that had five went out and and he worked hard and he was given five more. And the one with ten, he worked hard, he was given ten more. But the one who said, oh, my master's wicked, I'm going to just hide what he's given me and I'll give it back to him when he comes back. He says this, you're wicked and unfaithful servant. And he says, to whom much is given, more will be given. But to he who doesn't use what he has, the little that he has will be taken away from him. And God has invested something in your life and in my life and in the life of the church. And we must not neglect our calling. We must not neglect the things that God has given us. But we need to input into them and work on them and help them to grow. We must not neglect coming to church. It's so key, isn't it? But we can forget how important it is. How important the Sabbath is. How important this moment is, being here together. In fact, the Sabbath was God's example on the seventh day. We'll just wipe that off the camera feed. Did I get anyone else with that? That would be great, wouldn't it? Sabbath is so important. (laughs) In the in nominu patre spiritu sancti. (laughs) You could buy a caravan and you can go camping. You could buy a tent. You can go swimming. You can just have a lie in. But we forget sometimes that God commanded us, keep the Sabbath one day. This one day, keep it holy. Keep it set apart. Make it the time when you say, hey, do you know what? For six days I do what I want. I go where I want. But on the Sabbath, on the one day, I set myself aside. I get my family. I come to the house of God and I worship him for everything that he's done for me. You know, it doesn't matter whether the Sabbath is a Sunday or a Saturday. It it doesn't matter. It's not about what day it is. It's about that the one day a week I am setting this aside and come hell or high water. Of course, you're allowed to have an holiday. You can go on holiday. But, you know, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in the house of God, raising my hands, thanking Jesus for everything that he has done for me. And so, you know, the early church, it was the Lord's Day. You know, the first day, think about that, it's the Lord's day. Belongs to him. And the writer of the Hebrews tells us again, let us not neglect gathering together. You know, there are some boundaries and the things that, that we need to keep in our lives. And the basic, basic, basic thing is the Sabbath is being in church, being in God's house, laying that foundation. Nothing is going to keep me out of the house of God. Spending time in God's presence, spending time in God's word. Don't neglect that. God wants to speak to you. God has given you gifting. He wants you to reach this world and reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. He's given you talent. Some of you are artistic. Some of you can sing. You know, some of you can preach. Some of you got great personalities and you're able to share your faith. You know, some of you, it's administration. Some of these, you know, spiritual gifts. Let's not neglect the gift that God's given us because when we neglect it, what happens, suddenly we find it's gone. 
But if we feed the gift, it gets stronger. And to him who is given, much more will be given. So Jesus says to the disciples, we're going back. You know, sometimes, you know, when things, anybody ever made a mistake here? Anybody ever messed up? Anybody messed up in a relationship? You know, sometimes we mess things up so bad, we're like, it's too big, there's nothing I can do, and we just walk away. And this is where the nation of Israel were, we just, let's just leave it. But Jesus comes back and he says, oh, no, 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 come on, no, no, we're going there. We're going there. You ever, you, you, you ever had that where, you know, a relationship's broken down so bad, you know you need to go and do something, you need to go and apologize, you need to go and sort something out, you know there's something in your life and you've got to deal with it, and people are telling you, and you're like, no, we're not going there. No, no, we're not going there. We're not going there. No, we're not going there. You know, I, I had some issues growing up as a, as a young man. I was quite emotionally shut down, um, you know, and I kind of knew it. And uh, my kids knew it, and my wife knew it, and they get trying to talk to me about it, and I'm like, we're not going there. Yeah, we know we're not going there. We're not going there. We're not going there. I was afraid of emotion, and so I would never tell anyone how I'm feeling. I was guarded, and I would not, you know, allow myself. And it doesn't matter how many people would talk to me. So I really can be quite emotionally closed off, can't I? And that conversation would come up, and I said, we're not going there. We're not going now. But sometimes Jesus comes along and he says, do you know what, people? We've got to go there. No, no, we can't just leave this. I'm taking you to the other side and let me tell you, we're going now. I went there. It was very painful, but it was very good for me. I was set free and, and learned a lot about myself and began to grow because we're called to grow. And sometimes if we don't go back, we can't go forward. When God's leading us back and he says we need to go back and we need to sort that mess out, we're going to be better for it. And if we don't go back, we won't go forward. And so the disciples decide, you know, they've gone back. We're going to retake that which we lost. We're going to get back. We're going to go back. And sometimes going back is painful. Sometimes going back is difficult. You know, they went back and they hit a storm. You know, I don't like storms. I don't like it when things go wrong. I, want, I remember one time I was cycling um, back from, you know, I'd just been saved. And I was cycling back from church. And I said, God, you know, give me a career where I can have a nice, peaceful life. I think God just laughed. Lord, I, I want a peaceful life. You know, the same God that stood up and rebuked the wind and the waves. It's the same God that allowed the wind and the waves to happen in the first place. And sometimes we go through trials and struggles and difficulties. Sometimes we are led by the Spirit to go and sort things out that we know are difficult and challenging because God wants to teach us something about who we are, something about Him, because He wants to prepare us for a greater challenge that we're going to be facing down the road. Listen, you got gift. You've got talent. There's a call of God on your life. You cannot neglect it because it will just deteriorate and waste away. I've been watching a lot of the D-Day programs. It's been 80 years, hasn't it, since, since the D-Day landed. And Keith and I have been watching some things on the BBC, forgotten interviews of soldiers that were actually there. And uh, I've been watching recently again the, the film Saving Private Ryan. Has anybody seen that film? So it's a classic. And many of the soldiers that have seen the film said that's exactly you know, what it was like on those D-Day landings. Absolute carnage. You know, the, in, in the landing craft, very often the, 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 the doors would come down. And, and before they could even get out of the boat, three quarters of the soldiers had already been ripped to pieces by machine guns. And in the film, Saving Private Ryan, uh, there's this one private, and guess what his name is? Yes, you've seen it. Now, anyway, he's, he's got five brothers, and, and four of the brothers have been killed. And then when, it, when the film starts, it's this old man, and he's on the Norman, uh, Normandy uh, beaches where the graves are, you know, the, of the soldiers. And he's walking along, this old man, and he's just walking, and all the graves, the white, 
white crosses are around him. And behind, next to him, a little bit back, is his wife. And then behind him is his, his, uh, his son and his wife and all of his grandchildren. And he's slowly walking through this grave. And then it goes to Normandy, to the beaches, to the landing. And, you know, four of his brothers were killed. And he was the only person left. And so um, Tom Hanks and some other guys, band of brothers, he says their, their job was to go into occupied France and to find Private Ryan. And, you know, you, you follow this whole thing as they travel across Europe and all the, the, the battles and the battles and the challenges that they're in. And finally, they find Private Ryan and as they take, you know, and they begin to transport him back. And, and as they go one by one, all of these men that were sent to rescue him lost their lives. Until in the end, as they're rescued, he's lying there on the final scene with the bridge and the, you know, the guns are going over and he's the only one left. All of his rescuers had lost their lives in the pursuit of saving him. And then when the last of them dies, it goes back to the graveyard and he's standing there and he's looking down at the crosses. And he looks at his wife and he says, tears rolling down his eyes, tell me, I've been a good man. Tell me that I've been a good father. Tell me that their sacrifice was for something. And as he looked at his wife that he went home to and his children and his grandchildren, he realized that these men gave their lives so that he could live. And in that moment, he realized he had a responsibility not to throw his life away, but to live it to the full. You know what it says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1? In view of Christ's sacrifice, let us offer up our bodies as living sacrifices, pleasing to the Lord. Then we will understand what his will, his perfect will for us is. You know, Christ laid down his life so that your sin could be forgiven, so that my sin could be forgiven so that we could be set free from our mistakes. But it came with a cost. Our freedom came with a cost. And so we have a responsibility with this life that God has given us, not to neglect it, but to give ourselves wholeheartedly to the building of the kingdom of God, to the work of the God, to the work of the Holy Spirit. And to push on into what God has got for us. And so that at the end of our lives, we're going to hear that, that, that word, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, when we neglect things, when we don't give things the attention that they need, they begin to deteriorate. And other things begin to come in. Our vision gets clouded. And eventually, our heart becomes cold. Romans says this as well in chapter one of of uh, in sorry chapter twelve. Keep. Can anybody finish the verse off for me? Keep your spiritual further serving the Lord. How do you keep your passion? How do you keep your passion alive for Jesus? How do you keep believing God for greater and for more things? By serving the Lord, by jumping in, by joining the welcome team, by joining the worship team, by joining the youth team, by dedicating, committing yourself to reach your workplace, to reach your family. That's how you keep your passion. By serving the Lord. God fills you with his spirit and with fire and signs and wonders and miracles and incredible things happen. To him who has, more will be given.
Keep serving. Keep your heart pure. Don't allow things to settle. Don't allow the culture of the world to come into something that's meant to be part of the kingdom of God. You know, Proverbs 4 says this, guard your heart. Guard your heart because it is the wellspring of life. There were two American families in the 18th century, the McCoys and the Hartlets. And they both fought in the Civil War. They were on opposite sides of the Tennessee River. And in 18... Seven, in, in 1833, there was a dispute over a pig. Now, the McCoys found this pig, and because of the indentations in its ear, they said the pig was theirs. But the Hartlets, who also kept pigs, said, no, no, that pig is ours. And so this massive argument ensued over the ownership of a pig, and for 46 years... That family ward. And at the end of that 46 years, 13 relatives were dead, murdered. And in 2003, you know, the, the enmity, when the generation died, that the enmity continued to the children and the children's children and the grandkids. And in 2013, the, the Grandkids got together and they signed a treaty of peace. A hundred years of warring and fighting over the ownership of a pig. Come on, people. We can't allow grudges and unforgiveness to be in our heart. You know, Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower, you know, we've got to have good soil that when it's sown on the path, when that, our heart is hard, what happens? The birds of the air come and take it. If you've got a hard heart, you're not going to hear what God's saying to you. I'm a grudge keeper. I have to watch it. You know, there are a few people who have not been very nice to my family. And in my nature, I'm like, you're done. Like, you, you're done. You're dead to me. I don't even know your name anymore. And that's in my nature. There are some people I've got, mm. don't, no, don't even mention that name around me. But there's no room. If I want to hear from God, I can't hold grudges. I've got to learn to let things go. I've got to learn actually not to neglect my heart, but I've got to work on my heart. I want to show you a picture. And this is another soldier's story, if we could get that up. This is a, a picture. Do you know what that is? It's a Bible. And Lewis Wilson was in the First World War. He was a young man. He signed up. He was 19 years old. And uh, his auntie, Hannah, was a devout Christian. She gave him this Bible. She said, always keep the word of God close to your heart. You know what Psalm 119 says? It says this. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And in 1914, in the Battle of Flanders, as the troops went over the edge, uh, Lewis Wilson was running as a young man, 19 years old, charging across the, the dirty, uh, muddy fields of Flanders to the left. And to the right, his comrades were falling. He said in a later interview that he felt the bullets whizzing past him. He felt something skim his shoulder. He felt his legs skimmed. He felt his, his helmet skimmed. And when he got to the other side, he looked down and his trousers were torn, shot by a bullet. His shoulder ripped through. A bullet had gone straight through his, his lapel. His helmet was damaged where a bullet had just glanced off his head. And he's feeling around, trying to find anything. And as he looks in terror, he sees a great gaping hole over his chest. And he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out his Bible. And he'd been shot in the heart. And it had gone from revelation all the way through. And you'd be glad about this, Keely. It stopped at Genesis. 
There was Genesis that saved him. If you want to keep your heart pure, Psalm 119, keep the word of God close to your heart. Don't allow anything else in. Do not neglect your heart, but keep it full of the word of God. Meditate it on, you know, meditate on your heart night and day. And so Jesus takes the the disciples and they go back. And it's interesting, really, because earlier, later on in Mark, Mark chapter 7, you've got the Syrophoenician woman. You know this? She brings her daughter and her daughter has got a demonic problem. And Jesus says, I've only come for the children of Israel. And she gives that, you know, reply. Oh, you know, but even the dogs get the crumbs under the table. And if you read that on its own, you can think, well, Jesus really was, you know, at this time, he was, his ministry was only about reaching people from the nation of Israel. But when you read this in chapter 5, you realize, actually, that he was just teasing the faith out of her because he is deliberately gone to a Gentile country. And, you know, what that says is that, that there is no person, doesn't matter how bad they are or where they live or where they are, there is nobody that Jesus can't reach. He came to save that which is lost. And here's a man who's tormented with demonic problems in a land that was full of, of ungodly people. And Jesus takes the disciples right in there. And he completely sees demoniac delivered. And you know, the evil spirits come out, they go into the pigs, the pigs run over the bank. And then the people were like, Get out, you've ruined our pigs, we don't want you. And 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 Jesus left. And you think, well, you know. Come on, Jesus. You come to him. You said, we're going back. You know, we're going to the other side. They went to the other side. You've done this great miracle. Uh, but the land is still a mess. Nothing has been restored. It's still a place of complete ungodliness. And then you get this man whom Jesus had set free. He knew how bound and how miserable and how lost he was in a world without God. And he encounters the love of Jesus Christ. And as he meets Jesus, Jesus set him free from all those things that have held him back. And what was his response? I want to go with you. Let me in the boat. I want to go where you go. And you know, when we realize what Jesus Christ has saved us from, he saved us from judgment. He saved us from our guilt and our shame. He's cleansed us and he's given us a new heart and a new start. Our response should be, Jesus, wherever you're going, that's where I want to go. Wherever you are, Jesus, that's where I want to be. But Jesus says to him, I want you to stay here. I want you to stay here. And I want you to tell people what I have done. And that's God's plan. We're all on a boat. We're all on a journey. We're on a journey to reach people for Jesus, to bring change into this world. There are men and there are women, children and teenagers out there, just like demonia, they might not be full of evil spirits, but they are full of some of the sicknesses of our culture. Struggling in a place where they don't even know that God exists. But you know what? That's why we exist to tell the world what Jesus has done for us. So I want to encourage you, church, don't neglect your faith. Don't neglect your calling. Don't neglect meeting together in the house of God. Keep your heart full of the Word of God. And let's share the good news of Jesus Christ. And you know, as I finish, I would like to pray. Maybe for somebody here today. You've just been invited to this church. Maybe you've never been to church before. And in this moment, just like that man, you would ask, you would want to ask Jesus to come into your life. You'd want Jesus to forgive you. You want Jesus to give you a new start. He died on the cross for you. If you were the only person in the room today, he still would have died on the cross for you because he loves you and things in your life may have got overgrown 
You may have lost your dreams. You may have lost your hope. You may feel like you can never get back the things that you hoped for. But Jesus says to you today, come on, we're going back. I'm going to give you a new start. And I want to pray for you today. Maybe we could all just close our eyes. If you want to say this simple prayer with me, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. I want to follow you. You could just say that after me. And God's going to hear what you say in your heart today. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I know that my life has been a mess. I've made poor decisions. And I ask for your forgiveness. And I ask that you come into my life. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And you know what? Just as I get off, listen, if I have been speaking to somebody today, if you know right now that Jesus is saying to you, come on, we need to go back. We need to sort that out so that we can move forward. Let me encourage you. Just do it. Just trust God. You're going to see a miracle because that's who God is. He comes not to put us in the mess, but he comes to rescue us and take us out of it. Key and I are on holiday uh, for the next couple of Sundays. So um, we will be praying for you. We will be resting. We will be seeking God. And we'll be back with the fire of the Spirit and hopefully a suntan in two weeks' time. God bless you.